All right, cool. Uh, well, in case you um, didn't notice, I don't exactly have a very Anglo-Saxon last name. Um, you know, I come from an Italian family. Um, if you don't get my English, I'm very sorry about that. This is the best English I got. But um, uh, I have an Italian grandmother, okay? Um, and we're like nine grandkids, and she says she loves everyone equal. Um, I'm the favorite. Um, in any case, like, we, you know, we have a lot of software that we ship, and I love them all equal, um, but I do have a favorite um, that is Nomad. I absolutely love it, and um, many reasons. Um, it's, it's incredibly simple to just deploy and get a workload running. It handles on the heavy lifting, uh, register services with console, blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to sell you Nomad. Um, but when I joined HashCorp, it was like a very, very new product. So every time we shipped something new, it was like pretty cool. HashiConf two years ago, um, I skipped the slide, this happened. And we announced that Nomad actually had like an RBAC system. It had ACL, so you can actually manage what to do with Nomad. I'm kind of an organic speaker. I'll get to topic in a second. Just let's go with this. Anyway, so, you know, at that moment, it kind of hit me, this is actually very cool, because we also have this thing that manel, manages access management, which is Vault. So I can literally put Vault in front of Nomad and just use the workflow in Vault to just you know, get tokens. And you know, if I'm a human, I can go I don't know, authenticate using LDAP, get a token. If I'm a CI pipeline, I can use April or something like that, just get a short-lived token. Um, so coming up in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to explain you how I did that. Um, and pretty much I went from never writing a line of Go to actually having an MVP before HashiConf ended in 2017. Um, you can all read the agenda, I don't need to go through it. Um, in terms of who I am, uh, as I just love putting my picture there somewhere. So it's pretty cool. Um, we started, I started doing this thing where someone took a picture of me with the picture slide and then I kept kind of, you know, um, getting tunnel vision with my picture slides. Um, but anyway, this is a serious conference. Uh, so my job is approving expense reports. Um, to be honest, I have a team of about 16 engineers. Uh, but somehow um, the Vault team, which is super nice to me, I keep annoying them, I keep trying to, but you know, they're still super nice to me. They allow me to send PRs. Um, I was employee number 70. Um, or something. Um, this is my third HashiConf US, and I'm based just in London um, in the UK. Now, um, why would you do something like this? I, I'll tell you, you know, the couple of cases I've seen uh, in this past, you know, two or three years. Um, there was this company in the Nordics um, that was actually, I cannot go into too much detail, but let's just say they needed to cryptographically sign um, something very specific, and they were actually importing um, that chain of trust cryptographically. They were importing keys into Vault, and they didn't want to put them out. They didn't want the software to get it. They just wanted to consume those keys in terms of um, you know, signing these documents. Um, Vault, out of box, doesn't do that. But um, as Jeff said, in HashCorp Europe, Vault is turning pretty much on a platform, as opposed to you know, what it was maybe when I started in HashiCorp three years ago, just a tool to deliver secrets. Um, I know a company that actually wrote a plugin to broker access to an internal system that had pretty much like our software, you know, just API keys, and they wanted to have that, those API, the, the lifetime of all those API keys shortened. Um, you know, I had one that actually linked with a third party API that was specific to an industry. Um, now, a cool story is, as you know, uh, if you're using Vault, many of you are using Vault. I'm not going to ask for hands up, but you know, there, for the people watching this in YouTube, there are a couple of nodes. Um, so someone actually wanted to broker access to an Oracle database, like we do with MySQL or a SQL Server. This was about two years ago, and guess what? That ended up being in you know the master branch uh, of Vault. So that's something that we now support. Um, I know a few companies that actually write plugins that could be useful for our people and don't open source them. Uh, I'm not going to go to specifics on that. Now, on to why I did it. Um, I mean sales. So when I tell a story, I like it to fit, because I'm not really in sales. I'm a solutions engineer. 
So basically, if I go and tell you, here's where Vault fits, and it does access management, and here's where Nomad fits, and handles your scheduler, uh, guess what? If I cannot actually show you that, that kind of breaks my story. So honestly, the only reason is Vault just rocks. <laughs> um, I, God, it's been some very interesting three years that I um, had with this particular software. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I come from the upside of the house. I'm a super pragmatic person. So the whole approach Vault always made a lot of sense to me. Um, but most importantly, um, again, remember I'm from the UK. So if this joke doesn't make sense, it's because we drive on the other side in the UK. Um, I wasn't driving when I took that picture. Um, I, my, the, my insurer actually um, is a HashiCorp customer, so they might see this. Um, anyway, uh, keep left and less overtaking. And, and I think this sign should be in every ops team. Um, if you're not making things go faster, just keep left. Um, now, that sign is actually pretty ironic in that motorway, which is the M25, which actually looks like this most of the time. So you can keep left or right. You're not going anywhere. Um, OK, um, so what do I actually want it to accomplish? Pretty much this. Uh, you know, if I need to do something in Nomad, sure, I can have a long lib token that is provisioned by Nomad as it shipped um, back in the day. Um, but we do things better now, and we have a product that does that. So literally, I just want to plug into that workflow and say, I'm going to establish my identity, and uh, you know, based on a policy that's pre-existing, I'm going to get a Nomad token that allows me to do what I need to do. So um, this is funny because I wrote this code two years ago, so I can actually show you how it works. Uh, and I'm actually going to try it. Um, let me see that. So, Everything I need to do is establish my identity. You can't read that. Just say something. All right, cool. So I'm going to establish my identity with Vault. Cool. Um, in this case, I'm using the only identity method I have, which is OIDC. So I'm going against Google. Um, this actually popped up. Uh, a browser screen so I can do the Google um, login. You don't need to say it, I'm just clicking my name. Uh, and that sends a call back to Vault. Boom, I got a token. Now that I got a token and Vault knows who I am, Vault knows what I can do. And based on that, I can just go and read a credential. So I can do something like Vault read um, admin, no, nomad creds admin. Again, I wrote this API two years ago, so. Um, if I got it right, I actually get a token uh, that, you know, you can go ahead and write it pretty fast. The truth is it will expire in an hour, and that's a video fault. Even if you have it, I'm watching, at, I'm, I'm watching you for the next 35 minutes, so you can't do anything with that token. I can also, you know, um, potentially revoke it, which is an article thing about vault. Now, that, this is if I'm an operator and I actually want to deploy a job. Now, there is another interesting angle to this, which is, um, a while ago, I wrote this um, little app that basically tracks my library, and I wanted to make it like very distributed. And guess what? When someone actually goes and, add a book, and adds a book, I can just go ahead and request a token, um, which in this case is for a dispatch job in Nomad. So it's a parameterized job. It's something that I kind of pre-programmed, a function. And I just go ahead and tell it to run. Um, this is Ruby code, by the way. Uh, basically, what that is doing is the same thing I just did. It's just read a credential. And the application just gets a secret and tells its own scheduler, go and run something else. OK, so it's not only that, I don't know, you are doing the tail end of the deployment, and you actually want to po push a Nomad job and get something done. You can break your interactive workflow in your application and say, I'm going to leverage this scheduler uh, and actually just do what kind of an operating system scheduler does, but at the network level. OK, so just go and schedule this task. Um, again, I'm not telling you Nomad. You can literally do all this with Kubernetes, which I know might be in vogue. Um, anyway, uh, so that is what I wanted to accomplish. Uh, you can't believe, you honestly can't believe that I can't believe that this demo ran, um, because this is running again my, against my home um, 
cluster, which is on the Earth side of the Atlantic. Um, see if you can find the cluster that run that. So that's three Raspberry Pis plus um, one extra Raspberry Pi for the load balancer um, right at home. Anyway, uh, in order to do this, you must know that Vault is a heavily complex system, okay? It has a lot of logic. On the other hand, two years ago, the beauty of this is we actually created an interface. Um, so you can just leverage all this complexity through a plugin system. So you don't need to know all this. You need to know some of this, I'll be pretty honest with you. But you don't need to know all this in order to get things done. Um, and by the way, anecdotally, um, when I went in my usual excitement to try to convince people to actually write this plugin, um, they were like, yeah, sure, it's a great idea, and we all lined up, we will get there. But um, I, it was enough for me, so I said, I'll, I'll just go and write it. Maybe kind of to prove a point, maybe because I'm just annoying that way. So um, I did have a few problems. Um, the first one is, of course, I didn't know Go back then. I would argue I'll still have no idea of most stuff, but I know enough to be dangerous, which is good. Um, I was pretty jet lagged back then, as I am right now. So if I don't make sense again, I'm very sorry. Um, but I, I did knew quite a bit how Vault works, and, and that kind of gave me an, a somewhat of a fair advantage. I actually understand both how Nomad and Vault works, um, you know, quite extensively. Um, I'm also in the US, I'm in a conference, I'm surrounded by Vault engineers that I can simply annoy. Um, because I'm there, it's not just they can ignore, they, can, they, they couldn't ignore me on Slack. I was literally next to them. <laughs> it was like, Chris, 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 uh, he still loves me for some reason. Um, and of course I knew that we already had um, a plugin that was kind of doing the same thing that I wanted or a very similar thing, which was the console secret engine that we have in Nomad. Um, the, on a side note, the console and Nomad APIs for ACL are pre, or were pretty similar back in the day. Um, it's funny because like, it, the, the console was pretty basic. Nomad looked like a 1.5 and then console redid the API and it looks like a two on an imaginary if they were the, the same actual software. Um, the other fun part is that we, when we shipped the console, um, the, the second console ACL API, I was literally the last one to touch that code base. So guess who has two fingers and wrote the um, new console API? Um, sorry, the, the new integration from uh, Vault to console. And um, if you have complaints about documentation of that one, I'm very, very sorry, but I'm happy to explain the reasons of why I documented things that way. So um, what do I need to accomplish? Again, we said, Vault gives you all the heavy lifting, okay? So the system that maintains leases and TTLs, you already got that. Policies, you already got that. Um, authentication, you already got that, okay? That, that's fine, it's part of the platform, okay? It's another very good reason to choose Vault instead of writing a script to do the same thing. It gives me a lot of heavy lifting, okay, that we already did and that we are potentially already leveraging with a number of products. What I do need to teach Vault how to do is literally how to create a, a token and how to renew a token in Nomad. Um, you know, how to store the roles, which are these mappings between a path in the Vault API and the actual policy of the token in Nomad. Um, and of course I need to have a Nomad client to interact with Nomad. Um, I had kind of this idea on my mind, so I started splunking. And to start, um, what I need to do is instantiate a backend, okay? Um, this is literally heavy lifting we have already done. You just instantiate um, this structure that you will inherit things from, and you're going to declare a number of uh, paths that you're going to expose in the front end. It's always good to do remember what you're working with, and Vault, um, the only way to expose things outside of Vault is through a single interface, and that's the HTTP interface, and that's a lie, because there's another way, which is KMAP. But that is, you know, um, quite new and not particularly relevant to this, so let's go with that. The only way to expose things out of Vault is through an HTTP API. So what I'm doing there is literally declaring 
what are, what are going to be the front end paths that uh, I'm going to have present in that API when I mount this secret engine, okay? So when I add this to the API path. Um, I'm going to declare what type of backend it is. Um, you know, it can be type logical, which is for secrets, or type credential, which is an authentication backend. Um, I think there are a couple more, but you will have to go to Godoc, which is what I generally do. Um, you know, and the type of secret I'm storing there, which is in this case is just um, a standard secret. So that, that is kind of the, yeah, the, the, the base frame rails in terms of how to create your um, secret engine. From there on, what I'm going to start um, doing, well, before I actually start writing the, you know, the different logic in the API path, um, very basically, I, I just had to um, create a Nomad client that is inside the structure of the secret engine, okay? That Nomad client, on the other hand, it's going to have configuration, like Vault needs some sort of call credential um, or something in terms of actually um, storing, um, of, of actually storing and reading that token that Vault is going to use to, um, you know, talk to Nomad. Um, there is a very important point around that, and as you can see, there is a read config access uh, in terms of how to handle the configuration, because I do have it here, don't I? I really hope I have it here. So um, this is basically the, you know, the, the description of how that config access endpoint is created, okay? I have three things that I'm storing. Uh, I'm storing a URL for accessing Nomad, a token that I need to access Nomad, and an extra parameter, which is um, literally, um, um, I call it scheme, yeah, which is the same as console, which is if you're, I'm using HTTPS or, or HTTP. Or HTTP. Um, I don't know if I, I'm sorry about this, but there is one extra thing that you should know, um, which is particularly relevant for enterprise, and I'm trying to find it in my own code. I'm really hoping that this, was an old ver this wasn't an old version of the code, but it might be. Um, in Vault, a lot of people using Vault Enterprise. Okay, so in Vault Enterprise, you have this thing called seal wrap that actually allows you to um, kind of transit through an external cryptographic source like an HSM, transit whatever you store in Vault through an HSM. If you want to protect particular paths in that way, um, you have to uh, instantiate a path uh, special in the storage backend. I'm not sure if I have a code example, but if anyone has particular doubts on how to do it, they can go to GitHub and read this code, or they can ask me and I can show you exactly where to put it. Um, just to ensure that whatever you store in Vault, this is quite sensitive, right? This is a, a sort of goal credential that will allow you to create um, you know, further tokens, is protected to kind of a maximum level of security, if you will. Um, so uh, I kind of exposed that function, and then I literally um, wrote a function that what it does is plug, you know, kind of connects that API with the storage entry, where I'm going to store the configuration. Um, and as you can see here, and this is kind of one of the most beautiful things out of it, do you see any cryptographic function being called or anything? Um, it's that storage object there, that storage, um, it's just doing all the heavy lifting for you. Literally, I'm reading a JSON document from the storage backend, which as you know, it could be many, which as you also know, it should be console. Um, but basically, you know, all that heavy lifting, it was just handled by the, the you know, the, uh, the, the internal structures involved, which was, Fantastic to me. Okay, so let's recap. I have um, I have a path to store the configuration. I have a client, and that client knows where to read the configuration. So now I need to do some heavy lifting logic. Um, so basically, what I did here is define a secret token function that gets called when someone actually asks um, for a token and has you know two specific parameters. What to do with renew, we, in my case, it's create new, because Nomad doesn't have the TTLs on tokens, so it doesn't have the concept of renew in a token. Every time someone hits renew, I'm just creating a new one. Um, or I'm just renewing the lease in Vault, and that operation is transparent 
to your nomad. And I have a revoke, which is literally just go and delete the secret, okay? Um, as you can see, most of the logic here, um, basically when I hit it renew, uh, what, I'm good, what I'm doing there is um, just going and updating the list in the storage saying, give the secret more time. And when I do a revoke, um, what I'm doing is calling the nomad ACL, that C object there is the nomad client to just delete a particular token um, based on a value that I have stored on the list. Um, the other aspect is, as we said, we're creating different paths in the API. Remember the example I should show you where I have, I did, I can show it to you again. Where is it? There. So I did a read to nomad creds admin, okay? An admin is, that path in the API is linked to a specific um, policy in nomad. But this application I just showed you, which is running on the same cluster, is actually looking for a different path which is Nomad Cred's dispatch. These different paths generate tokens that uh, have different TTLs and they are aligned to different policies. For example, the admin tokens are the one I potentially use to actually go and deploy a job manually. That dispatch token only allows this application to run an instance of a particular job with a certain set of parameters, okay? So in order to enable that logic, what I had to do and I'm going to go back to my slides, is store these roles, this mapping in the API. And of course I had to teach, no, teach Vault how to create logic around it, okay? And you know, where to store it and so on. Validate the parameters you know, on the types of token um, and literally just store a JSON entry um, with that information. Um, as I said, this is probably the meat of it. Go and create a secret. Um, which um, calls to a, a particular operation in the API, which is the path read. Um, when I do that path read, um, what I'm going to do is the actual nomad logic of creating a secret. Um, and basically what I'm doing is generating random name uh, for the token, and again, you see that C object there? Um, remember that I told you C is the nomad client. Um, basically what I'm doing is just calling that nomad client with a create. Um, pretty simple. Um, as you see, I haven't put any of the logic there that makes Vault great. Vault is just doing that on its own. When I call path token read, um, it's going to go do the logic, um, create a lease, store, um, in this case, return the token, but only store the accessor to the token. In Nomad you have tokens and you have accessor to those tokens that only handle the administrative operations on a token. Um, and this is pretty important. Um, you seriously know what the best secret is? Um, it's written there, it's the one you don't know about. So when I did this first, the first iteration of my code, um, I was actually just storing anything, everything in the uh, backend. I was storing the secret and the accessor. And then I had this comment from um, Chris, who literally asked me, why are you keeping the secret ID? You know, you don't need it. Like, I can revoke a token without having the token through the accessor. So it was pretty much like, okay, now I get it. Um, of course, console back then didn't have that, and I was basing the logic in console. Console just had tokens. It didn't have accessors, so you had to, st to store the token. Um, here's the beauty of it. In most of the database plugins, uh, most of the secret engines, Bolt is not even storing your secrets, um, which is probably one of the coolest thing, because when your um, infosec department starts, um, you know, throwing, let's call it, wheelbarrows of theory at you in terms of where you can actually store or not store the secrets, you can just answer them, we are not storing any secrets in Vault. And hopefully they'll go like that. Um, anyway, um, so I said plugin when I started this, and I, so far I showed you basically the logic. Um, but if you're running your own plugin for whatever reason, um, if you have created your own plugin, 
probably you don't want it, or your own logic into Vault, you probably don't, you don't want it, you know, kind of merging into Vault or maintaining a fork, and that's why we actually create a plugin interface. You can go and grab that logic, put it in sort of a separate um, deliverable, something that you maintain, something that is at no point tied to the Vault mainline, you just interface through it. Um, and that's what we did, basically. We created a plugin subsystem um, in order for these plugins to be loaded. I, wa I want to say at runtime, um, yeah, I'm 99% 99 sure that this is at runtime. Basically, when Vault comes up, it's going to read the mount table and it's going to load this um, the extra binaries into memory. Um, and basically to extend that functionality. But if you go and upgrade Vault, lights keep blinking. You don't need to maintain a fork if you have your own logic. You maintain it completely separately. Um, so basically you have to add a little bit of wrapping to um, your logic code. And this is, I can't remember exactly from which um, secret engine I took the example, but you can pretty much copy and paste this and that's it. Um, just take this code, copy and paste it, and then create your uh, function uh, structure in Vault, however you're pleased. This will literally tie up, tie up with your backend. Um, so basically, this is going to do the heavy lifting in terms of the mutual TLS and so on with Vault, establish the RPC connection, and from there on, it's going to instantiate your backend, and that will, from there on, I called it backend, you can call it whatever you want. Um, but yeah, from there on, it's just going to kind of bring up your logic. Uh, so a couple of lessons learned. Um, I know this is controversial, but error handling in Go is just the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, seriously, um, I, I'm used to kind of Python or Ruby. Uh, remember, I'm not a developer. So um, actually having to kind of manage exceptions, it's very painful. It was quite refreshing to go like, if error is nil, that's cool, just keep going. Um, there, there, seriously, and, and I think I tried to point out all the ones I've seen, most of the stuff while I was writing this, it looked magical, it felt magical, and again, for someone that hadn't written a single line of Go, it was like, I'm going to get a compile failure any second now, any second, any second, and the thing built, and I was like, okay, um, I guess it works. Um, but yeah, it worked. It's, it was really interesting. Um, if you're running Vault, and I'm generally more on the run side of Vault, always remember that, um, the best kept secret is the one you don't know about. Um, so I know a lot of people go and, um, I don't know, they will put Vault here and then um, they don't want to break their workflow. So maybe they'll put Ansible here, and Ansible will pull secrets from Vault and throw them there. Then Ansible knows the secret as well. Um, same thing with Terraform. A lot of people, you know, will kind of use Terraform in that um, uh, sort of runtimey way, where Terraform is actually not my infrastructure as code. It's also my deployment tool. It pipes a process or whatever. Um, Terraform can and absolutely should consume secrets from Vault. It should consume secrets from Vault that die within that Terraform runtime. Because if they are disclosing logs, if they are disclosing the state, guess what? Um, when Terraform starts up, it, it's going to create a child token of whatever token it got, and then at the end of a run, it's going to revoke that token. So every dynamic secret created by Terraform is going to be revoked as well. So just think on that. Don't pull secrets uh, you know, from Vault using Terraform that shouldn't actually be on Terraform, that Terraform doesn't specifically need. There are a ton of alternatives. Um, the Vault agent now actually has a templating engine. So just use Terraform to deploy the Vault agent, and the Vault agent will write your templates. Um, of course, the neatest way to do this is just have your application consume from the API. I know, it's generally not possible. Um, attach all your functions to the backend of your uh, plugin. Don't kind of leave them hanging in your, um, in your um, Go package. Um, just always call back to the backend. You have only one object to instantiate. Um, if I had a pound, British pound in this case, which is our currency, has the queen on it, um, actually, actually um, the new 50 pound bill is pretty cool, and you should all Google who's in the 50 uh, pound note or bill. 
Huh? I'm not, I cannot, I'm not allowed to make any comments on that. Um, so if I had, um, seriously, a dollar for each if error equals nil, um, like from error handling, it, again, maybe 30% of my code. Um, the beauty of it is 60% of it is just mapping interface that already exists in Vault. So how many effort did I did? It's probably 10%. Uh, it's, it's actually fantastic. Um, GoDoc is your friend. Um, Again, and I keep saying this uh, to the team that writes Vault, the documentation in Godoc is absolutely fantastic. Um, you can actually write plugins in different languages, or so I've been told. I haven't seen it, but it is a gRPC interface. So technically, you can. I've never seen it happen. Um, please document what you do, OK? Um, if you have it on, you know, we, HashiCorp, we basically maintain also the website. So basically, every time we merge something into Vault, we go and merge documentation in it, um, both the API documentation and sort of the basic product documentation um, you see. And what we do on top is we try to write a guide that actually explains how it works. Because sometimes you can really look at, I know, the PKI backend has 20, 30 parameters. So yeah, you probably need examples. Those are on learn.hashcorp.com. If you're writing a plugin and you're publishing it, please write documentation. Try to mimic our structure. Just show how it's configured on a very basic level and then put an API reference um, so people can actually understand what's the power of your plugin without actually having to go to the code um, and read it. Um, if you need more reference, the full code um, is there. Um, at the time of merge, um, it was written up to best practices. If you can track historically the PR, you will see that there are at least 80 comments, and that was my first code review. Um, we are pretty hard when it comes to com code reviews. But on my second one, it was easier. On my third one, I only had one. Um, so. Uh, yeah, the full code is in repository, is up to best practices. Uh, by the way, just a secret, it took me a day to write the plugin, it took me three to write the tests. Um, <laughs> whole different animal. Uh, Seth Vargo, back in the day, he's in the closing keynote tomorrow, um, he, he wrote a very good post on this, and he has an example of an authentication plugin, if you want to see uh, the flip side of that. Um, there is a deep dive that um, Joel did on the Vault AWS um, auth backend, um, because when we shipped it, he, he had a better idea on how to actually do a workflow, and he actually contributed it, so it, it was pretty good. Uh, and there is a talk about how um, the GCP authentication plugin uh, was made, also um, very recommended. And I'm writing time. So with that, I'm going to be around. If you want to ask questions, um, just find me, or you have my GitHub. You can find me on Freedout. Uh, thank you very much for listening.